professionalism is synonymous with value. And when people see professionalism, it automatically translates intrinsically into value. Hello and welcome to episode 185 of the Smart Agents Podcast. As always, my name is Michael Walter and I'll be your host. On today's episode, we are joined by 50-year real estate vet and winner of the 2015 Realtor of the Year in Dallas Awards, Sonny Moyers. Between 2004 and 2018, Sonny was in the top 4% of all real estate agents nationwide and has recently released his book, The Architecture of the Real Estate Practice. Throughout our conversation, Sonny shares practical advice for building a successful real estate practice that will not only survive but thrive regardless of market conditions. From tips on differentiating yourself in a crowded market to the importance of demonstrating professional proficiency, Sonny draws on real life stories to drive his points home. But before we get on to the day's featured interview, the Smart Agents magazine is available and is full of insights and strategies designed to help real estate agents grow their businesses. Inside, you will find interviews and advice from leading real estate professionals, marketing tips to flood your business with leads, and even swipe and deploy files full of practical tools to enhance your business. Subscribe now to receive your copy of the printed magazine each month and instantly get access to our online agent community and members-only templates. Click the link in the episode description or go to smartagents.com forward slash magazine. Also, if you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to like and subscribe. The Smart Agents podcast streams on all major podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and of course, YouTube. And finally, if you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message at feedback at smartagents.com. We're always on the lookout for new stories to share. All right, let's get on to the day's featured interview with Sonny Moyers. You can get your own copy of his brand new book, The Architecture of the Real Estate Practice, for yourself at realestatebook.org. Really, the way I like to start everything out is if you could just introduce yourself to us a little bit, who you are, and a little background on your real estate career. Well, my name is Sonny Moyers, and I got involved in real estate at a very young age. I was going to college in Abilene, Texas at Abilene Christian University. And I was unusual. I was playing football. I had a wife and a, a baby. And so I was uh, very young and uh, I needed to make money. And I, while I was playing football, I still needed to make enough money to take care of my family. And so I looked for an opportunity to become an assistant manager in an apartment complex because that provided shelter and some other perks. Right. Absolutely. Of course, I was, I was 19 years old. Mm -hmm. So... The I don't know why they hired me, but they did. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, I think I, I'm a big believer in something called intuitive thinking. Uh, people might call it first impression or uh, curb appeal is another way of saying it. But I two weeks after I accepted the position, the manager walked over to my apartments and handed me an armload of books and said, Sonny, I'm leaving. Contact the owner tomorrow and Good luck. And he was gone. Oh, wow. So I had a pouch filled with money and checks and cash and the keys. And 19 years old, I found the gentleman's name was W.R. Dick Kendrick, <laughs> Kendrick Realty and Associates. <clears throat> and he owned the apartment complex and a shopping center and a lot of other property. He was very wealthy. And I arranged to meet with him. And he seemed very puzzled when we met because I was 19 years old, had a wife, a baby, was going to school and playing football. And he was, I'm sure he was wondering, how the heck did you get the job as my assistant manager? Yeah. And now you're here handing me the keys in the checkbook. And he, uh, we talked for a good 30, 45 minutes. And he very uh, soon after starting our discussion, seemed to be very warmed up to me and seemed to be very very friendly and very willing to, to to consider me. And by the time I left his office, I had the job as the manager of the apartment complex. Wow. Now, in all fairness, it was a smaller com uh, complex. It was 26, 28 units. Mm -hmm. But in Abilene, Texas, it was a national complex. Yeah, absolutely. And, but, um, and he, he became a mentor. And he later asked me to get involved in real estate. I think he thought that my football career at Abilene Christian would make me a good draw for being in real estate. And 
combined with the fact that I was majoring in management with a minor in communications. And that's how I got into real estate. Right. And tell us, when was that? And, you know, when... Uh... I'd have to go back to 1974. I've been a real estate agent and now a broker for 50 plus years. Wow. So I'm, I, you would say I'm at the, I wouldn't say the end of my career, but the twilight, but I certainly am not wanting to work the 60 to 70 hour weeks that I worked for many years. And people have a little misconception about real estate that it's an easy business and that you, you know, have, you have banker's hours, as they might call it. Well, that's not the case at all. You work weekends, evenings, whenever you need to work. And I was, uh, I got into residential real estate with my mentor, Dick Kendrick, and then later got involved in commercial real estate. And so when we, Judy and I, my wife partner, formed our real estate practice that we operated for 20 plus years, we uh, had a commercial tenant representation in large buildings, and we had a residential section, which Judy was the lead on, and I was the lead in commercial. And then we also had a consulting element. So we had a very different business model, and that's a lot about what my book is about, which we'll talk about later. But I, it really created a unique business model where we did uh, all things for a client. We could represent them on their personal residence. We could represent them on investment property, uh, shopping centers, uh, commercial, large leases and buildings. And of course, consulting was where I consulted worldwide in a prior career in 20 different countries in marketing and sales. Oh, wow. And so that, that career was real estate related. I provided consulting to real estate related companies all over the world. And when I got tired of traveling, I decided to join my wife. And that's why we formed our real estate group. Uh, we were affiliated with a very large, successful brokerage here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area called Ebby Halliday Real Estate. And it was a very su successful firm. And we became one of the top people within that firm pretty quickly, actually. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just, you know, looking and reading your bio, I mean, there's several years worth of uh, top agents in Dallas or top agents, you know, countrywide. So absolutely. And over the 50 years that you've been in real estate, you've seen all kind of market ups and downs and twists and turns. That's a great, uh, that's a great comment. And I think you're right. Being in real estate for a long period of time, you see the six, the cycles and you see mm -hmm. the good times and the bad times. But I'll also tell you that for your listeners, that if you're a good realtor, you're successful through all those. Because quite frankly, when the market is weaker, there are client needs that make you still very valuable if you're good, okay? Yeah. And in the hot times, you're gonna make a lot of money because it's, things are really good and you've got a lot, of, a lot of possibilities. But one thing I would say to people is that every time there's a down market, it's an opportunity. For example, there was a down market around 2008 in our area, and we tripled our advertising and marketing. Now, what most people were pulling back, but well, we used that opportunity to gain market share. Yeah. And we did that. Uh, our advertising and marketing budget was for just my little group was over 100,000 a year. And most real estate agents don't spend very much of that. So, so but we, we actually grew our market share dramatically through a recession. So what I would say to people who are listening, if you're in real estate uh, or you're considering going into real estate, don't look at it as a down market as a bad time because people who have problems selling their property or who, who need to move a property but are having a hard time with it, that's when they need you the most. And that's when if you're a consultative oriented real estate agent rather than a product salesperson, you'll do great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and those are all a lot of the things that I want to touch on, um, you know, a little bit more in depth uh, as it pertains, you know, to what you have uh, written in your book and what you're sharing uh, with folks now. Um, but before we get into that, tell me a little bit about, um, you know, writing your book and, and the reason why you're wanting to share all this information now. Well, I was, I was very uh, successful and very fortunate. Uh, I was nominated for the Realtor of the Year here in Dallas, Texas. By the, um, I was nominated by a group of people, a large, large, large neighborhood. And 
I was competing with a lot of other agents and they came down to three finalists. And this was done by the Dallas Builders Association. You can imagine with the Dallas Metroplex with 7.1 million uh, population, there was a lot of real estate agents in Texas and DFW area. North Texas is a very competitive area. And <clears throat> was nominated for that. And it came down to three interviews. And I, at the three interviews, I competed against two other the finalists, three finalists. And at that in those interviews, face-to-face -face interviews, I did extremely well because I shared many of the concepts of how I work with people, not prospects, not clients, but people, and how I, I personalized the relationship with my clientele and how I was a consultative collaborative oriented real estate agent rather than a master of all things who told them what they needed to know and asked them to do what I told them to do. And so my approach was quite different. And I won that award as the best realtor in Dallas that year. Mm -hmm. There was only one. You could only win. Oh, I've been D Magazine Best of Dallas for 15, 16 years, mm -hmm. but that's maybe 200 people win that. To win that award and be the only one who could win it uh, upon doing my acceptance speech, you might say, which was thanking everybody for who I who had helped me get where I was, it, it occurred to me that I should share a lot of my knowledge with other people. And there became became the genesis or the beginning of the idea to write a book that would be a help book. It wouldn't be a get rich quick book. It wouldn't be a book about contracts because they'll go to classes to get that knowledge. They'll, they'll have to learn the proper way to work contracts. It, it wouldn't be a book about uh, flipping houses and making a million overnight. It would be a practical book of how to build a real estate organization, how to build a practice that could sustain itself and be successful over a long period of time through good and bad times. And that that book would be something I would like to write. Well, it took me a while to get around to writing it, but it's now here and it's quite a different book. It's a 300 page hardback book uh, with color uh, and in the in the book itself. And you will probably appreciate this because I'm sure you're very up on technology. There are QR codes in the book that when you scan them, they take you to my YouTube channel where there's video about that particular chapter that that QR code is in. And there's also over 5,000 words of the language of real estate. What happens if you're talking to a client and they say this, what do you say? So I would say it's more of a reference manual. It's a, it's a, man, it's a book that's designed to be an accompanying part of your real estate practice for many years. It's over 300 pages and it's a very detailed and complex book the subtitle is The Psychology and Art of the Real Estate Profession. My master's degree is in psychology, which human behavioral theory is the subject of most interest in that. And um, it was a multidisciplined one of it was um, human behavior theory. The other part was research methods and then interpersonal communications theory, yeah, which so is what I deal with a lot in the book. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, really, so, I mean, listening to your description of the book and then seeing it for myself, it really, you know, it, it, it looks like, you know, this is the textbook that every real estate agent that I've ever spoken to says they really wish they had when they were getting their license because they didn't learn any of this kind of stuff. This was the stuff that they had to figure out on their own. Uh, and, well, you know. It, yeah, and you're absolutely right. And that does explain why a lot of people go into real estate and fail mm -hmm. uh, because they come into real estate, uh, Michael, with a uh, some misconceptions. And they believe that if they pass the test and get their license and that they subsequently affiliate with a strong agency, that they'll be successful and that they assume that their manager or broker will give them leads and they assume that people will just start calling them and say, I want to buy a house. I'm going to speak primarily about residential real estate at this moment because commercial is quite different. But those misconceptions cause people to go into the business who are not prepared. 
they don't know how to write a business, create a business model. They don't know how to write a marketing plan. They don't know how to identify target markets. They don't know how to design a marketing program that would differentiate them from their competitors. And they don't know how to differentiate themselves. If I ask a typical agent who's been in the business for two or three years, how do you differentiate yourself from the other competitors that you compete against? They get, go kind of blank and they really can't tell me how they're different. Or, and, you know, it's, it's, it's great to be better, but you got to be different. So in my neighborhood that I live here in Prosper, Texas, there's about 1,500 homes. These homes start at 500 and go to two or three million. Okay. Now, there are about 75 agents who live in this neighborhood. And there's a whole, a whole bit more agents who want to do business in this neighborhood. Now, if you take those 1,500 homes and divide it just by the 75 who live in here, you see how competitive it is. So, so those of you that are going into real estate, I'll talk to the audience for just a minute. You have to be different. You have to be able to stand out in a crowd. You have to be distinct. And you, and you hopefully you're better. But whether you're better or not, you better be different. And you better be noticeable. And so we created a brand and a model that was quite different. We did a single point of contact approach for all things real estate. So many of our clients did their office lease with us, purchased a home with us, bought their vacation home with us, referred their family and friends, and opened up their sphere of influence to us. And that's how we were so successful. And people need to listen to somebody who's been successful to, to learn because a lot there's a lot of copycat marketing in real estate. People go into real estate and they look at the other people who are operating and they copy what they were doing. And that's a mistake because that doesn't differentiate you. In fact, it makes you look more like the other agents. And before long, all the agents become ubiquitous, offering the same thing. And you don't want to do that. So we created a business model that was tenant representation, uh, commercial real estate, mm -hmm. residential real estate, and consulting. Yeah. And that business model was quite different than anyone else. And then my wife and I were a team, but we were both brokers. We weren't one person who had the credentials and the other person kind of put up signs. You right. know what I mean? Right. We both could do everything in real estate. I was better in commercial. She was better in residential. But between the two of us, we had very powerful credentials. So when we met with someone, we had not only had two people that were part of a team, but we also had both of us had our own credentials. And we each had our own areas of strength that augmented and helped each other to become more successful. So we created a very, very different business model. In chapter 38 of the book, I share that business model. I show people how to create a business model and how to begin to differentiate themselves from the competition. And that's what the book's about. Yeah, absolutely. It's how to build a real estate practice. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, a big, a big part of that, um, you know, differentiated yourself is just even the approach that you take with people and, sure. you know, how you, um, you know, communicate with people once, once they, you know, once you're sitting down at the, uh, the dinner table with them going over, you know, your, your presentation or, or whatever it is that you're using to, um, you know, get them to decide to do business with you. So I want to kind of talk a little bit about the, um, the communication tactics and some of the psychology uh, tips that you uh, that you have gained over the course of your career and that you're sharing uh, with agents now. Yeah, I'll be glad to do that. In fact, um, let me just talk about one thing is that we took some philosophies that are part of the Real Estate Licensing Act, and that was put the client first. And we made that a major part of our presentations and our programs. We stress that we will always put you first. And of course, we make a commission. And of course, we get paid. But you want us to. You want us to be great. And you want us to do a great job for you. Now, we focused on we're not going to make decisions and recommend something that's not in your best interest. That fiduciary relationship was sacrosanct to us. It, it made the client feel comfortable and trust us. And when the client feels trust, that's how you really capture them for a long time. 
the other thing that we did, we we took a concept that I created in my consulting and teaching abroad, uh, and that was that professionalism is synonymous with value. And when people see professionalism, it automatically translates intrinsically into value. And that interpretation of professionalism, when they see someone who's highly professional in everything they do, every document they prepare, everything they create, that's what this book was designed to demonstrate, that this is not the typical book. And so when you think about professionalism as synonymous with value, one of the most difficult things to do in real estate, when you have a real estate world where some people charge 4.5% to list a home, and some people charge 6% to list a home, and at times we charge 7% to list a home. One of the most difficult things to do is to defend your commission, to justify what you charge. And we did that through this concept called professionalism is synonymous with value. From the first meeting to everything we did, we emphasized that professionalism concept. And what that does intrinsically, psychologically, people support their first impressions. So if you're highly professional and very competent, then they automatically support that impression. And that builds up such a strong uh, feeling to, to choose us that it created a compelling reason for them to choose us over the others and to not argue about our commission. Because you justified the commission by the quality of what you did. So we very seldom had to negotiate our commission. And that's why we never had a set commission of it's going to be X percent. So I get a lot of questions in today's market about the lawsuits that are happening and all about the, the, uh, all the issues that came up about real estate representation. It's not an issue. When you put the client first and you defend your your rate that you charge, whatever that rate is, based upon competence and quality and representation and putting the client first, you, you don't have those disputes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, you know, and you talk about putting the client first and, um, you know, letting them make the decision that is best for them. And I think that really uh, ties well into that whole, uh, the concept of the uh, consultative you know, selling and uh, collaborative selling, because if you're not, if you're not listening to your client and you're, you know, pushing, you know, properties or different ideas that are going to line your wallet a little bit more, you're definitely not helping uh, them in the long run. You have to be true to yourself. And that is, remember that you're always putting the client first. And let me give you an example. I worked with a client who moved here and bought a very expensive home in Dallas, Fort Worth area, a million five home is really very nice home and uh, defend the parts, depend on the parts of the country that you're in. A million five may not be a very right. expensive home, but here it's a very nice home in the suburbs of Dallas. Uh, these people moved away. And when they came back, they called me and they said, Sonny, are you still doing real estate? And of course, yes, I am. And they said, well, we want you to represent us. We know the builder we want to build with. And we know the neighborhood we want to live in. Will you help us? Now, why did they do that? Because they knew from my prior experience with them that I would always put them first and they would get superior services, not average, not good, great. And when you think about what you're trying to provide, our business model described what was greatness in being an agent. And it described in great detail how we would go about proving to the client that we were great, not just good. Mm -hmm. And you may remember the the book, Good to Great, Mm -hmm. Jim Collins. And we also used another book called uh, uh, Raving Fans by Ken Blanchard. Mm -hmm. Okay, And those became some of the marching standards that we set. People always ask, what's a culture in an organization? The culture is the concepts and theories and philosophies that you found in the beginning of that organization and that you carry forward faithfully throughout the time that you operate your business. And so in here, there's keystone concepts. And these keystone concepts are those. Mm -hmm. They're the fundamental philosophies that you operate under. Most agents don't know how to even visualize that. 
because they haven't done it before. And since you've read my profile, you know that I've done a lot of different things in marketing theory, a lot of things in organizational design. And so I have a very deep background in doing that. So when we created our business model, I call that the payoff chapter here in the mm -hmm. book. And the reason is it tells somebody what they need to do. And then it actually shows them a model that I created so that they don't copy it, but they emulate it. They say, this is the way to do it. Here's how I can do it. So that's what it's about. Now, in this particular client, uh, we went through the process of them purchasing a home. It happened to be in my neighborhood where I live. And I had the great relationship with them from historical. And it was a $2.1 million home. Okay. Now, after we did the contract, the builder called me up and said, Sonny, are you aware that there's a $10,000 bonus for the agent representing the buyer on that home? I said, no, I'm not aware of that, but I'm glad there is. And they said, well, you've earned that $10,000 bonus because they contracted for that home. So what should I do and what did I do? Mm -hmm. I called up my client, happened to be I could only reach the wife at that particular moment. And I said, uh, dear friend, uh, I wanted you to let you know that the builder called me and told me that there's a $10,000 bonus for the agent who brings the client on that particular lot and home that you're building. Now, I want you to know that I'm disclosing to you that that bonus is there. It's for anyone who sells it. But I want to make sure with you that it's okay that I receive that bonus. Because if it isn't, I've got several options. One option is to give it back to the builder and say, no, I don't want it. Another option is for me to take that $10,000 commission. And a third option is for me to give you the $10,000. What would you like me to do? There's a little bit of silence on the phone. And she said, Sonny, we know that you're worth every penny that you make. You keep the 10000 Now, that's relationship of trust and confidence. If you don't trust your client and you haven't demonstrated the value of what you provide to them in such a way that you feel comfortable doing what I did, then you're going to be hesitant, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. And you should always disclose the money you're receiving. So th that worked out great, didn't it? Yeah. I have also had it not work out right. Yeah. I have yeah. also had a client who said, no, I want the $5,000. Right. And I gave it to him. So when you're an agent and you work with principles, philosophies and ethics, always putting the client first, you don't get into lawsuits. You don't, you don't get into conflicts and problems as much. You still get into conflicts, but it's usually about different things than money as far as that goes. So what I would say to your audience is, look, just do the right thing. You know, uh, if you you would want them someone to disclose it, wouldn't you? Yeah, well, absolutely. Someone was going to get $10,000. You'd want to yeah. know about it. Yeah. They could have said, let's split it, you know, mm -hmm. but they didn't. They said, it's yours. Now, why? They want me to make money. They want me to be successful because I'm good at what I do. And they're going to be closing here in about 90 days. We've been through a process now. During that process, I called them up and I said, let's just pretend that they're Michael, okay? Mm -hmm. I said, Michael, we have a problem. Oh, what's the problem? The side of the lot slopes down to the extreme. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be a retaining wall on that side of the property because the slope is very, very sharp. Your fence, when you look out your window, will be about four feet tall. It's an eight foot fence, but because of the drop, it'll be about eight feet. It'll be about four feet tall. And you'll be looking over that fence into your neighbor's home. This happens to be a half acre lot in a $2.1 million home. So you, they don't want that, right? Right. So we went back to the builder and said, we want you to build a wall there. Now, I didn't worry about what the builder thought about me. I represented my client. And we went through the normal uh, gyrations of telling a builder, that you purchased the home for $2.1 million uh, to build uh, and that they needed to spend about $20,000 on a wall that they didn't plan on spending. Right. And what the builder did was come back and said, 
Sonny, we're going to build that wall for no charge to the client. We value you and the relationship you have with your clients, and we're going to do the right thing, and we're going to build that wall. So you, ha you have an obligation to bring up things to your client that you know that are wrong and that have to be fixed. So when I say put the client first, some agents might say, gee, should I even mention that? Well, of course you should. Yeah. Because it needed to be done. Yeah. So yes. when you talk about a principled agent with great ethics, they usually win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of those concepts also, and, and not even concepts, but just ways of doing business uh, that regardless of, you know, what the, um, the value of the, the property is, whether, the, whether or not the person is experienced uh, in purchasing, whether if it's their first time purchasing a home, first time selling, if you give that same level of service every single time, you know, I can't tell you how many people I've spoken to that, you know, they, it, they sold a home for somebody that was really on the lower end of what they've sold. And five, six, seven years later, that person has, you know, climbed their, their career and now they're ready to purchase, you know, that, yeah. that $2.1 million home. Right. And you're the person that they are, they're going to. Well, great, great point. And can I bring up another concept that I cover in the book? Yeah, absolutely. You read any of Malcolm Gladwell's books? Yes. You know, Tipping Point, Blink, mm -hmm. uh, David Goliath. There's a great number of books there. And he's mm -hmm. a great author. I'm mm -hmm. a big fan of his. In fact, I quote him a lot in my book. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, he brings up in one of his books, I believe it's Tipping Point, The Law of the Few. And what you just said touches on that concept. And I think we we really connect together mm -hmm. on the, some of the same concepts from our discussion today. Um, the law of the few, many, most agents go into real estate thinking they're going to sell a whole bunch of homes to a whole bunch of different unrelated people. Yeah. But the reality is that in real estate, once you get a really good client and once you build a trust in the relationship, you end up working with a relatively few number of people. In fact, Judy and I went back and looked at a 10-year period in our firm and we said, all right, in that period of time, how many people, because we had a very enhanced CRM, uh, Client Relationship Management Program, and our CRM allowed us to see who we worked with, who they referred to us, and what happened from that, and who those people referred to us. So we could see the originating source of leads mm -hmm. within our practice. And we found that 15 people represented about over 80% of the revenues for a 10-year period. Wow. 15 people. Now, they referred yeah. people who referred people. Right. But when you start out, so your comment about someone moving up the ladder, you have to look at real estate and relationships with clients. Let's just say that you have a client that's 35 years old. Now, I'm a lot older than that, Michael, <laughs> uh, a lot older. But let's say that you're a 35 or 40-year-old agent and you have a client who's 35 years old. You can anticipate that if unless that client moves away and they could move back, that you could have a relationship with them for 30 years. And if they move every seven, five to seven or eight years, you could have multiple transactions with that client during their lifetime. Now, not only that, the people they refer to you could have a similar situation. Now, most people, if I said to someone, do you have an account plan and an account client management program for managing the relationships in your real estate practice over the next 30 years, they would look at me and say, what right. are you talking about? Okay. One entire chapter of this book is about client management programs. One section of this book is about account planning. So when you have a client like that, they are gold. And you have to manage the relationship and the reason you need to manage the relationship, and I'm going to give you a term here that you may not have heard before, although I'm, I'm wondering if you have, because you seem very up to, up to speed on a lot of things. But remember, I'm an old guy. I've been around a long time. <laughs> the client relationship <clears throat> must survive closing. Now, that's an interesting statement. Right. The client relationship... I didn't say friendship. The client relationship 
must survive closing. You see, most people think of real estate buyers, sellers. Think of real estate as, I need an agent. I'm going to go get me one. They're going to help me sell or buy. We're going to go to closing. They're going to give me a gift. We're going to celebrate. They're going to go away. Now, if you run your practice correctly with account client management programs and with account planning and with a sophisticated approach toward client management, that relationship would survive closing. After closing, after it's done, they don't think that you're gone. They think you're going to be with them as their trusted advocate for all future relationships. And that's why that client called me back and said, we want you. And so th th when you talk about sophisticated marketing approaches, have you ever heard the term, you must have a client management program, you must have account planning to manage those clients, and you need to have, make sure that all closings with clients assure that the client relationship survives closing. Yeah. Most of what I write about in my book, no one's taught before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think those are all, those concepts and things. I think um, a lot of times when you get into this, or you talk to any real estate agent, it, you know, it's like, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's, that's the, what I want to do, but it's, do you have anything in place to actually achieve that? Yeah. The, oh, well, of course you do. If you're, mm -hmm. If you're a sophisticated marketing mm -hmm. organization, yeah. uh, and what I describe in my book is the client relationship, the client management program is a very comprehensive, specific program of the things you're going to do. I also, also introduced some concepts in there called account cycling and things that you may not have heard of in managing a real estate firm. Uh, and that is to assure that all clients receive a level of care after closing that assures that they continue to see you as a valued resource and that you're important to them and they need you. Right. Because most people think after closing, they don't need you for a while. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's your duty to stay in touch with them, right? So that five or seven years or later, they still remember you and they call you. But this goes way deeper than that. This is how do you get that person, that, that client, to share the information about their family, their parents, their grandparents, their children. How do you get them to share and open up that information and then their sphere of influence mm -hmm. so that they embrace you as the person they want to help? They want to make sure that you value them through time. Now, when an agent closes on a property, and they spend the next five years sending cards that say, I sold another home. Or they send cards saying, I won another award. Or they send a card or a letter saying, I made a whole bunch of money. Mm -hmm. That does nothing to build a client relationship. In fact, what it does to some extent, it causes the client to say, uh, quit sending me all this stuff about selling stuff. I'm not ready to sell my home or buy a home. I love where I'm at. I'm not moving. Sonny, quit bugging me. Instead, you should be talking to them about how you can help them, how you can help them with their current situation and how you can be, remain a part of their lives so that five or seven years from now, they want to find you. Now, you should have stayed in touch with them too, right? To make sure they can find you. But marketing is way more. When you look at real estate sales, as a client relationships that are marketing for 20 to 30 years. So I have clients that have done eight or 10 transactions with me because I've been in the business a long time. That's how you build the value of a practice. Right. And, you know, so one of the things you touched on, and I think a lot of, uh, a lot of people are, are guilty of is, you know, they'll, they'll have their, their past client list or their, you know, the people they've done business with and they'll have them on that list and they will only get that email or the, you know, postcard for their latest listing okay. or, you know, something like that is going on. So what are some of the things that you uh, suggest or some of that information to share with those past clients to keep them, um, you know, to make sure that they still view you as that, yeah. market expert that is up to date on the current market conditions. 
Michael, this is an amazing interview because you're asking me to talk about things that most people don't ask me to talk about. And I appreciate that uh, because it's helpful to the person who's going into real estate. Uh, Let's talk about perception sale. And I don't know if you've ever heard that particular term. A perception sale is a sale that may not make you any money, but changes the perception of the other party, the client, the prospect, so that they see you as a value benefit to them, not just in real estate, but in, in general. Okay, so let me tell you about a perception sale. I call up my client and I say, Michael, this is Sonny. Wow, we've had a great time, haven't we, in real estate here? Your home's gone up, mine's gone up, everybody's happy. Yeah, Sonny, I never imagined it would go up 60% in four years. I mean, this is incredible. Yeah. And hey, Michael, I'm a little bit worried about you. Sonny, what are you worried about me for? Well, I want to make sure that your insurance that you maintain on your home is keeping up with the value of your home. Because if you're underinsured and you had a major loss, it could cost you a lot of money out of pocket. So what I've done, if, you, if it's all right with you, I'd like to send you a CMA. Now, I know you're not moving. I know you're not ready to sell your home. But I want to send you a CMA so that you see the value of your home. And you can then get with your insurance agent and compare how much your maximum insurance is, well, how much would you get from maximum if you had a total loss, yeah. and compare that to the value of your home to make sure you're not underinsured. Mm-hmm. Can I do that for you? And you send them a CMA that shows the value is $1.6 million, and they paid maybe $1.2 million. And their insurance maximum payout is about $1.4 million. But they haven't kept up with their insurance, have they? Right. Now they've got a choice. They can self-insure or they could raise their values, right? So that's a perception sale. Now, when you make a perception sale, you demonstrate proficiency in something other than real estate that has direct impact on the lives of your client. And that's the value. And that's how they love you when they're not looking for a home. And that's why they want to hear from you. And they don't want to hear from you about every listing you got and every sale you made and how much money you made and how you're the the multi-million dollar producer. They don't care about that. How do you impact and affect their lives? That's what's important. So when when people build a real estate business and they copy, everybody sends cards. Don't do that. Do something different. If the whole world is sending cards saying, I listed a property, I sold a property, don't do that. Do something different. Be innovative and creative enough in your marketing to create original content that has a hook to it that's not, I'm great. In fact, it should be, Michael, you're great. Right. Right. And I think what, you know, that example that you gave, um, you know, there are so many different things that you can do as markets change and as things shift, but by uh, providing that value that, you know, that individualized value to that, you know, that person in your sphere, that past client, uh, regardless if they're ready to, you know, buy or sell, even in the next 10 years, you have still, you have kind of relit that match that's kind of burning in their head of whenever somebody asks about, you know, a real estate professional or somebody they've used or somebody they recommend, that match is still burning and that light's still on pointing your way. Yeah, they'll they'll say something like, my agent's different. My agent's really different. My agent puts me first. My agent's not worried about how much commission they're going to make on a deal. They want to make a a great, help me make a great decision. I was um, at that interview I told you about with the Dallas Builders Association. They asked me why people choose me And I said, because I don't sell homes. So I had this couple come in relocating from Canada. In the book, I changed all the names so that nobody gets put on the spot. Coming in from Canada, and I was going to meet them at the hotel. And when I met them at the hotel, I walked in expecting they'd be ready to go. go, We were going to go on a, a neighborhood tour just to look at neighborhoods. And instead, they were in the lobby and they waved me over. And they and I had only, I had never met them before. I talked to them on the phone numerous times. And they said, Sonny, sit down. We want to talk to you for a minute. And I thought, oh, I wonder what this is going to be about. 
They said, listen, we had three people recommended to us. And you were one of the three. And all three are great. All three have great credentials and a lot of experience and highly recommended. Why should we choose you over the others? You know, we're coming here to the area to buy a home. And we're looking for the best agent to represent us that will make sure we do the right thing. And that's a pretty tough spot to be in. Is So if you're an agent out there watching this podcast, what would you have said? Well, I'll tell you what I said. I said, Michael, the reason you should choose me is I don't sell homes. I help people make good decisions. I help people. I solve problems. I'm a consultative real estate agent, not a product salesperson. Now, you told me that you might want to move back to Canada at some point. So the decision you make in buying a home has to consider your exit plan for that home. How are you going to sell it someday? And for that reason, you need to make a good decision now so that you maximize your gain or minimize any loss when you sell that home in five, seven, or 10 years from now. And they said, Sonny, that is a really good answer. And I could see that I really scored big. And then the wife said to me, she said, Sonny, you in this book you gave us, I gave, I gave out a book, I shipped it to them, called The Finding a Home Guidebook, which I talk about in my book, uh, about why you should have it. And it was a binder about this thick, and it was a one-inch binder, and it was about buying homes. And it wasn't how to decorate a home and stuff like that. It was the philosophy was about contracts and and what you have to do with in our local area and things like that. It was very it was a very complex book and very very valuable. And you talk a lot in there about school districts. And we're curious about one thing. Uh, we don't have any children. So why are school districts so important to us? And I said, well. We just talked a minute ago about the fact that someday you're going to sell. Well, about 90% of the people who move here move with a family. And schools are important to them. So when you get ready to sell, your exit plan has to consider what school district you're in. Because if the school district you're in is poorly rated or it's not a great school district, it could affect how much you sell the home for and how quickly it sells. And the gentleman that I was working with, the client, who hadn't signed any agreements yet, by the way, they did not have a representation agreement with me yet, said to me, Sonny, we were going to let the other agents know who, who we chose uh, after our interview today. Uh, let's go ahead and go look at homes. We're choosing you. And I'll let them know in a little while. Now, that, what I want to do, Michael, mm -hmm. when I'm meeting with the client, I want to make such an overwhelming, powerful presentation filled with such benefit and value that the prospect feels compelled to choose me. Not just that I should might want to consider. I want them to feel I have to have this person. Now, your presentation has to be that powerful because when you're competing with two other award-winning agents who sell $20 million a year in real estate, and they're making a decision between the three of you, and you could make thirty or forty thousand dollars on this transaction, as long as you put the client first. You have to compete to win. So when you think about, um, now if we're going a little bit long, but I wanted to make sure I don't yeah. take too much of your time because mm -hmm. my time is yours, <laughs> oh, and my time is for your audience. Okay, okay. Uh, especially those out there that are figuring how do I make money in this business and how do I mm -hmm. how do I become successful over a long period of time. Uh, demonstrating uh, proficiency is another key concept I talk about in the book. You must demonstrate proficiency. It's not that you have a, a logo on your card that says you're an expert. That's shallow proof. You must de demonstrate proficiency to a prospect so that they have no doubt that you are the most proficient agent and helping them and having your name a card that says you're an expert in relocation 
does not convince them that you're an expert. In fact, they don't even know what it means most of the time. You've got all these little logos on your card that says we're experts. And now, is it good to have those uh, those uh, logos and those um, designations? Of course, but that's not going. That's shallow proof. It doesn't really sell that you are the best. So if you claim to be something, you better demonstrate it. So I hope that this interview with us today is a demonstration of proficiency from me so that people look at this and go, he does what he claims we should be doing, and that is demonstrate proficiency so that the prospect that you want to capture in your marketing net and hold them long enough in that net so that you can make a perception sale and demonstrate proficiency, and then they feel compelled to choose you. Yeah, That's what it's about. Yeah, absolutely. Real and estate think, is an amazing business. Uh, I've made a lot of money, but I'll tell you something. The relationships I've formed, the people who've been loyal to me, that's the gold in real estate. It's great to make money, but you will never forget when you help a client achieve something they've been dreamed about for many, many years. And that's a, one of the most rewarding things you can do in real estate. And I want your audience and your the people who are watching this video to learn from this video and be more successful and be able to achieve more and enjoy it more. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there are so many different concepts and, and so much in your book that we, I mean, we honestly, we could have a whole series of interviews to really dive into it. But I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd love to talk to you again. And, but, and with so much of the stuff that you've talked about, and I think, I, I think we were, we were recording when you mentioned, when we were uh, touching on this, but a lot of these concepts, uh, and if you, if by showing this proficiency and, and providing this value, it, you are building a real estate business and a real estate practice that is, you know, it is not dependent on the market. It is market proof. Mm -hmm. Can I, do you have time for one more story? Yeah, absolutely. All right. I don't want to, I don't want to take too much of your time <laughs> if you're, if you have other commitments. No. Uh, I had a client that I wanted to capture his commercial real estate business. I wanted to be his tenant rep in a large buildings. And he had multiple locations with 20,000 square feet or more in his business. And I had been trying to get him to agree with me to have me be his agent for a long time. And I kept calling him. And he would always say to me, Sonny, I've got four or five brokers. None of them have an agreement with me. You want me to be, you me to be exclusive to you, right? Yes. He said, well, I've got these guys. They're doing a great job for me. I don't need you. I said, okay. Well, what's the biggest problem you have in your business? He said, well, I have three locations that I have. They're all over 15,000 square feet. And my leases are, I'm upside down on my leases. I'm paying more than the market uh, because of the time when I signed the leases. And I need to renegotiate those leases. I said, well, did you go to your broker that did those leases with you? He said, yeah, it happened to be the same guy. And I asked him if he would help me go in and renegotiate those leases. And he said, no, he didn't want to offend the building ownership. And so he didn't really want to do that. And I said, I'll do it for you because I put you first all the time, every time. It may make somebody mad, but the way if I do it right, Michael, it won't make them mad. Mm -hmm. In fact, they'll be glad that I saved their 15,000 square foot tenant in that building. Okay. And I got my foot in the door helping him do that. Now we renegotiated those leases and he had said to me at the time, Sonny, I don't know how I'm going to pay you for this because the broker, the building's not going to pay you any money. I said, don't worry about that. I'll, I'll make a deal with you, Michael. If I save you $5,000 a month on your lease at this building, you give me 10% of it and you pay me monthly or quarterly the savings that you got. And he said, you'll do that? I said, sure. That's the consulting side of my business. Now, I renegotiated three of his leases. I made over $200,000 over time. He became a client 
And for the next 16 plus years, I was his exclusive agent. And I made a lot of money working with him. And he became a great friend and a great client. We still talk today. Awesome. He sold the business and made a lot of money and rode off into the sunset. <laughs> and that was the day that I cried <laughs> yeah. because he was leaving, you know? Right. When, when you have a client who you lose, not because of anything you did wrong, but because it's time. Mm -hmm. They either move away or they, everybody loses clients based upon something, but you've always got to have great marketing to find new people. And that's where you're looking for. Those people in that, you don't send a thousand mailers to a neighborhood to get 200 clients. You send a thousand pieces to a neighborhood of marketing pieces that are unique and different and distinct to get one or two people who will be a client for life. And they will refer you multiple people and they want you to make money and they want you to be successful. And that's what real estate is all about. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, again, we could go on for honestly hours uh, talking, <laughs> but I do want to ask you uh, for our listeners that do want to get a copy of your book, where can they go to, uh, uh, to get a copy? Ingram Spark is going to be distributing the book uh, everywhere that they distribute, which is pretty much worldwide. In the meantime, my website at realestatebook.org, they can get the book right now. It's not a cheap book. It's $64.95 a copy plus shipping, but it's worth every penny of it because it is not only a great book in the sense of content, but it's a great book because you can go back to it for years. My goal when I wrote the book was that you would have this book on your shelf and something would happen in your day-to-day -day work and you would say, he wrote about that in the book and they would pull this book down and go back and revisit that chapter and that's what that's what the, the difference would be. It's got QR codes in it that people can hover over and click to. It'll take them to my YouTube channel where they'll see a video, an exclusive to the book video, about the content in that chapter. So uh, realestatebook.org. They can go to my YouTube channel, uh, The Architecture of the Real Estate Practice. That's a rather long name. But th if they just Google me, Sonny Moyers, Real Estate Dallas, Fort Worth area, th they'll find me. And uh, Sonny Moyer's author, whatever. And I've got a lot of videos and podcasts on, on YouTube. But I think the one thing I want to stress to your audience and to you, my goal is to help people. Of course, I want to make money. Of course, I want to sell books. But my goal is to give something a benefit and value because that's what you have to do for your clients. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, I really do appreciate you taking the time uh, to speak with us today. And uh, I will definitely be keeping in touch. Thanks so much. I want to thank Sonny for joining us today, and it's easy to see why he's had all the success he has over his career. Remember, if you would like to get your own copy of his book for yourself, just go to realestatebook.org. So once again, if you think you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message at feedback at smartagents.com. Well, that wraps things up for this episode, but remember, follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents YouTube channel. Again, I'm Michael Walter, and we'll see you on the next episode.